end where I can kind of summarize the contract um, like how I would to a buyer. So I'd act like a buyer's agent, summarize the contract for you guys. Okay, so this is what, week five. We left off on section 01. And this actually should go pretty quick. I wouldn't expect the remaining part of this to go very long. So uh, let's see, we already finished 01, 02, and 03. Those are the, the different termination clauses. You guys need a contract? No? Okay. So 04. So mediation, if any dispute or claim arises out of this purchase contract prior to, prior to or after closing between buyer and seller or between buyer and or seller and a brokerage firm and all its licenses, licenses assisting in this transaction and the parties to such dispute or claim are unable to resolve the dispute, buyer and seller agree in good faith to attempt to settle such dispute or claim by non-binding mediation. This paragraph should not apply to any complaint of unethical conduct against a brokerage firm and all its license, licensees who are obligated to comply with the code of ethics of the National Association of Realtors. Such complaints against a brokerage firm or its licensees assisting in this transaction must be brought before the local board of realtors of which the brokerage firm and all its licensees are members. Okay, so I guess what it's saying is if there's a dispute, uh, both parties agree to try and resolve it through mediation, right? Through mediation. Now, arbitration, if any dispute or claim arises out of this purchase contract during this transaction or at any time after closing between buyer and seller or between buyer and their seller and a brokerage firm, and all, all its licensees assisting in this transaction. And if such dispute cannot be resolved through mediation, then the parties are encouraged to consider arbitration as an alternative to litigation. It is recommended that the parties seek legal counsel to make this determination, right? So can't resolve it through mediation. It's saying go through arbitration. And then if you can't resolve it there or don't, don't want to, then they can consider uh, litigation. Okay, would you like to do, uh, let's see, why don't you do 06 and 07? Did you show the contract problem on the screen? Um, after. After. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Third party claims. It is understood that if a dispute or claim is made by or against a third party who is not obligated or willing to mediate or arbitrate such dispute or claim, the buyer and seller shall not be required to mediate or arbitrate. Such dispute or claim. <laughs> kind of like they want you to do mediation, arbitration, but if you don't want to, you <laughs> yeah. Have, yeah. Uh, choice of law and forum. The property is located in the state of Hawaii. The purchase contract shall be governed by and construed according to the laws of the state of Hawaii. All legal actions and proceedings concerning the purchase contract and or the property shall be filed and conducted in the appropriate state or federal court located in the state of Hawaii. Any mediation, arbitration, and or litigation in the state court shall be filed and conducted in the county where the property is located. Okay, so it's saying you have to follow Hawaii state laws and if you go through mediation, arbitration, or litigation, It'll be filed and conducted in the county where the property is located. So, if it's on a if it's sitting in county of Honolulu, it'll be here. County of Kauai, it'll be if it's on Kauai, county of Kauai, right? Let me comment on what you just said too, Doug. Yeah, is that the a mediation? I think a lot of people, if you haven't been through it, it's not a, a situation where somebody decides something for you the way you would if you went to a court of law and even an arbitration. And things like Judge Judy and those shows on TV are actually arbitration cases. They're handled under the rules of arbitration. They're not really a court case. Um, but in a mediation, the parties agree to an outcome. So that's why the rule of this contract is you start with mediation and if you can't come to an agreement, then it goes to arbitration. Um, so it's, it's not, they're not mutually exclusive. You start with one conditionally and then you go to the next level. Okay. 
Uh, attorney's fees in the event of a default by a party under illegal action or arbitration, including a claim by a brokerage firm for commission, commission, the prevailing party shall be entitled to recover all costs incurred, including reasonable attorney's fees. Okay, so let's be aware of that. Um, P1, you want to read P1 for us? P1, Hawaii Real Property Tax Act, withholding required if seller is not is a uh, non-resident of the state of Hawaii. Pursuant to Hawaii revised state statute section, section 2356A, if seller is not, is a non-resident person or entity, corporation, partnership, LLC, trust, or estate of the state of Hawaii, the buyer must withhold a specified percentage of the amount realized by seller of the sale of the property and for the amount is appropriate form to the State Department of Taxation. Tax, taxation. Such withholding may not be required if seller obtains and provides buyer with an authorized exemption or waiver from withholding. If seller does not provide buyer with a certificate of exemption or waiver from PARMCA no later than 14 days prior to scheduled closing date, escrow is hereby authorized instructed to withhold collect from seller the required amount at closing and report to the state department taxation. So you guys all understand that, right? We're going to harp this. So this is really for um, the state to make sure that the person selling the, that property, um, that if you're not a Hawaii resident and if they don't pay state taxes, that they, they let escrow know um, and then escrow will then withhold, right? Because what the state is worried about is somebody selling the property, getting the funds, not paying state taxes, and not ever coming back to the state. Thus, they will lose all that revenue. So they put it on the on the seller. I'm sorry, they put it on the buyer, right? They put it on the buyer to make sure that happens. I've never experienced that where um, there was an issue, but it's important to understand that because if you're the you're representing the buyer and you know the seller is not a Hawaii resident or not a um, um, a U.S. citizen and they don't pay taxes, um, that's that's something to be aware of. That buyer then becomes responsible for that. Okay. It's really escrow. Escrow has to, you know, they're a neutral third party, so they're going to process all the documentation. But when you know that you as the buyer are responsible for it, I think it, it prompts you to be a little bit more cautious and make sure that uh, everyone who, whoever, whoever can answer this question, which would be the, which would be the seller and the, um, I would think the agent and the brokerage representing the seller, that they answer these questions, get it in writing that they are a, a, a state resident or a non-state resident. Get that in writing. Because I think you, you got to do all you can as a buyer's agent to make sure that, one, you know their disposition, and two, is documented somewhere. Um, actually, I take that back. There was one where we represented seller, I think. You know, I don't remember it enough to describe it, but there was a there was some issue with that. That's anyway, the toughest ones I think, right? When you have short sales because there's no money, so they have to file an exemption. Yeah, there is an exemption, and that exemption is is mainly if there's there's no no um, estimated taxes to pay. I think that's mainly what it's for, right? So you can file an exemption, and uh, either or, if if they can qualify for the exemption. For non-residents. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if they're uh, mainly if you know they buy it high and they sell it low, there's no there's no there's no uh, gain, right? Right. So there's no tax consequence. Challenge you have is if somebody, let's say I bought a unit for one hundred forty thousand, and we and we actually have this going on with viruses transactions. So they bought the units, let's say seventy thousand. They started. They had water claim. They started to do the work. Uh, the association had the work done. 
the unit owners stop paying association fees. They put a lien against the property. They have 18 months of mounting fees and they have a lien against it for paying to shut the water off and repair the damage that was caused inside the unit. And um, there was a gain on the property, but the buyer pulled money out. So, you know, we saw this the last time we had the mortgage meltdown, right? So you could buy a place for 100,000. It could have appreciated to 200,000 and you took 200,000 out and you sell it for 220 and it doesn't cover all the fees, but you still owe gain on $100,000. Yeah. So now the, you know, the, the state is like, no, 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 you still owe money. Like, but there's no money there to send you. They're a rock. Oh, from proceeds you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened on that? Uh, we're going to see on this one right now because I've never dealt with it on Harp I've dealt with it before on, on Harp Duck, but not on Harp Duck. Okay. I'm going to bounce around. Uh, Robert, if you're there, can you read uh, uh, P2, please? P2, foreign investment in real property tax, Harp Withholding required is if the seller is a foreign person pursuant to 26 U.S. Code section 1445, if seller is a foreign person or entity, non-resident alien, corporation, partnership, LLC, trust, or estate, buyer must generally withhold a specific percentage of the amount realized by the seller on the sale of the property and for the amount with the appropriate form to the Internal Revenue Service IRS, such withholding may be not required if seller obtains, a, obtains and provides seller buyer with the authorized exemption or waiver form from withholding. If seller does not provide buyer with a certificate or exemption or waiver from PERPTA no later than 14 days prior to closing date, escrow is Escrow is hereby authorized to instruct the withhold slash collection from the seller the required amount at closing and is and forward it to the IRS. Okay, so similar situation, except in this case, it's for uh, anyone who's a non US citizen, right? Earlier was non um, a resident, this one is non US citizen. Every so the state has a percentage, the feds have a percentage. I don't recall the percentages offhand, but the percentage is not of uh, estimated profit, right? It's of the sales price, so it could be pretty significant. I think it's like ten percent and five percent, something like that. Okay, so like, can you read P three? P3, additional disclosures re <clears throat> required by foreign buyers and sellers. Buyer and seller understand that under statutes and ordinances, such as the Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act of 1978, the International Investment and Trade in Services, <clears throat> Services Survey Act, and the ordinances of the various counties of the state of Hawaii, among others, disclosures are required by foreign buyers and our sellers under certain conditions. So I, I, do you know what that one is for, Lisa? I don't know, P3. <laughs> uh, I stepped out for a second, let me look at it quickly. Um, Additional disclosures. Well, yeah, so what happened you know, during 9-11 and some other issues, there can be, um, Gosh, my brain is going to have to resource this pretty quickly. There have been situations where there have been foreign uh, parties that may have issues with the government where I don't know if it's laundering funds or they're you know, hiding monies, et cetera. So there could be other government laws that are being investigated that require disclosure. Okay, so it's just a disclosure if... Well, any ordinance. So, okay. you know, that there could be ordinances... Uh, Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act. I'm not sure about that one. Yeah. But the uh, International Investment and Trade and Services uh, Survey Act, I think this one came out just like five or maybe six or seven years ago. Okay. And it has to do with um, basically federal policing of investment for foreign countries. Okay. Okay. All right. So section two is blank. Uh, R1. 
Let's see. Atta, you want to read R1 for us? Yeah, R1, scope of services and disclaimer by brokerage firms. Brokerage firms assisting in this transaction, including their owners, licensees, salespersons, agents, and employees, strongly recommend that buyer and seller each consult their own attorney, the state planner, accountant, appraiser, architect, pest control expert, home inspector, insurance advisor, contractor, land surveyor, electrical engineer, civil engineer, structure engineer, soils engineer, land use professional, zoning expert, environmental expert, designer, title insurer, other professionals, and the subject matter experts should they have any questions within those fields about this transaction. Buyer and seller understand that brokerage firms have not made any representation of warranties and have not rendered any opinions about A, legal or tax consequences of this transaction, B, the legality, validity or correctness, status, existence or lack of any building permits, which may have been required for the property. C, the land area of the property, the location of the boundaries or the size of any improvements on the property, or D, any of the matters set forth in paragraph one I6 general disclosures. Buyer and seller understand and acknowledge the parties are not relying upon brokerage firms for any of the foregoing services or advice. Okay, thank you. So that's a big one to me, right? This is, so this section is all the disclaimers, or not all, but disclaimers about what we as, as realtors um, are not really able to do for our clients. When you first started real estate or, you know, just in any job, right? When people ask you a question, you, you try to answer. It's just human nature. You try to answer their question. But when you read R1, it kind of puts it into perspective. Who, you know, we are realtors. We're not engineers. We're not surveyors. We're not contractors. We're not home inspectors. So you have to be careful not to give your client the perception that you are an expert in those areas, because otherwise that might come back to haunt you later if they make a decision based on what you've told them because they perceive you to be the expert only to find out that either you were wrong or something else happened, they're, not, they're unhappy now, and they'll come back and complain, which then goes back to where we were earlier about 04, 05, right? Mediation, arbitration, you wanna avoid all those kinds of things. So when there are things that come up like settlement or, or mold or, you know, um, resale value, things of that nature. Be careful about how you answer those questions. Um, if there's concern, then let them know. They have the right to go and seek out expert help. Go and hire a structural engineer. Go hire an accountant. Go hire an attorney so that it'll satisfy your, your, your concern about the property. Um, I always like to point this out to, to agents because... It's right here in the contract. It tells you exactly what you're not. I mean, unless you are one, right? Unless you are a practicing attorney and a realtor, then it says right here, if you need legal assistance, go and seek that out. Okay, next disclosure, rental property. Chihiro, can you read R2 for us? Okay, R2, rental property. Buyer understands that seller and brokerage firms are not offering to sell or selling the property together with any existing or further future rental pool or other rental arrangement. Seller and the brokerage firms make no representation or guarantees about future rents. Buyer understands that should buyer rent the property after closing, Buyer is assur assuming all risks related to all the foregoing. His sales include real property only and intend to not to convey uh, security or investment security as defined by the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission or other convey uh, secure, oh, other governmental agency. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, we we can't we can't make any guarantees about future rents. 
all we can tell them is if it is being rented, here's a rental agreement. And if they want to rent it in the future, we can't guarantee what it'll be rented for, right? And that, at that point, I just point them to um, Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace or some reliable source that can kind of give you an idea as to what the rental value of that property might be, yeah. Um, future resale values. Seller and brokerage firms make no representation or guarantees about the future resale values. So I just heard that next year, the Fed was going to raise increase rates three times. So I would expect then our interest rates to start going up, which then could affect the market. Whereas we've seen, you know, years and years of growth and um, prices going up, you know, now at some point plateau and then, you know, either in Hawaii, hopefully not going on very much at all. Because historically, our market has been very stable. It'll go up kind of flatten out, might dip a little and go back up again. On the mainland, it'd go up, it might drop 100% or, or 50%, which then means it has to go back up 100% to go back to where it came from. But when you know the market levels out, or if it goes down, um, you know, buyers, I think, uh, are more inclined to complain about things if they're not happy. And you know, if they buy a piece of property and the values go down, they may not be too happy about that. So just be aware, right? We can't, we can't guarantee what the future resale value of these properties will be. Um, obligations, brokerage firms should not be held liable to either buyer or seller for failure or either of either buyer or seller to perform their obligations under this purchase contract. So yeah, I mean, you know, we, we can guide our clients, but they have to perform. It's, it's their contract. They're the ones who are signing. They have to perform, right? Permission, the parties grant brokerage firms permission to supply data to the MLS regarding the sales price terms and listing status of this transaction for the use of by other brokers and real estate professionals in making market studies, providing service to the public and advising their clients. So basically information can be supplied to MLS for various uses. Um, R6, disclosure of real estate licensing status. Hawaii law provides that the licensee shall not acquire, rent, lease, sell, or exchange an interest in or buy, rent, lease, sell, or exchange for oneself, any member of the licensee's immediate family or brokerage firm, or any entity in which the licensee has any ownership interest, property listed with the licensee, licensee's brokerage firm, or listed with any other brokerage firm or licensee without making the true position known in writing. So if you form a group and you guys decide to buy and flip, or if your, uh, your family is selling and you're, you're part of the owner of that property, or if you're buying and you're part of that group that's buying, make sure you disclose right here. Um, even if it's a little, a little iffy, like let's say you're going to do an LLC or something in you haven't finalized that yet, but you're going to be a part of that. It still might make, might be uh, safer to disclose, right? That uh, you're a licensed, you're, you're a active uh, real estate licensee in the state of Hawaii, something of that sort. Okay, general provisions. Um, I'm just going to finish reading this. And then what I'm going to do, if it's okay with you guys, is I'll finish reading this section. And then um, with the remaining time, I'll, I'll present the, uh, the contract to you as though you're my buyer. So that, so that way, it'll kind of summarize all that we've talked about. Um, I'm not going to go in de into detail, but I'll hit the highlights just to give you a, a sense as to how I would deliver it to, to my buyer plan. Okay. So under general provisions, acceptance state, um, as used in this purchase contract, the term acceptance state means the date on which this purchase contract becomes binding upon, upon the parties. Uh, dates and times, as used in this purchase contract, the term day means calendar day. So never uh, business day. This contract is always calendar day, unless otherwise specified in writing. And all dates and times are based on Hawaii standard time. For purposes of counting days within this purchase contract, one day commences the day after the event. For example, if the event is acceptance date on May 1st, uh, May 1st, day one is May 2nd. And 10 days after the acceptance date is May 11th. 
unless otherwise specified in writing, this purchase contract contingencies and all other dates in this purchase contract should expire on 11.59 p.m. HST on the day stated. Okay, so we sign a contract today, both buyer and sell, it's executed. Day one starts tomorrow. Um, J1 ends on the 15th, let's say, or let's say J1 ends on January 10th. So if it's the 10th, J1 expires at 11.59 p.m. on the 10th of January, okay? The dates can get kind of confusing, but if you look at it right here, it's pretty clear as to how to count. So if it's executed today, tomorrow is day one, okay? Time is of the essence, except as otherwise provided in this purchase contract, time is of the essence and the performance by all parties of their respective obligations under this purchase contract. This includes compliance with all contingency and other time periods stated in this purchase contract. Okay, for housing, buyer and seller agree to comply with all federal and state for housing and anti-discrimination law that prohibits discrimination based on buyer's race, color, national origin, ancestry, religion, sex, including gender, identity, or expression, sexual orientation, handicap, disability, familial status, marital status, age, or human, holy. In, can you pronounce that? Immunodeficiency virus infection. Seller could become aware of buyer's inclusion in any of the above classes through various methods, including but not limited to personal meetings, open house, and showing social media posts, cover letters, photos, uh, photographs, or other documentation. Okay, so just follow for housing. Um, electronic digital fax signatures. So you can execute electronically, right? Electronically executed copies of this purchase contract and any related documents will be fully binding and effective for all purposes whether or not originally executed documents are transmitted to escrow. Electronic signatures on documents will be treated the same as original signatures. However, each party agrees to promptly forward original executed documents to escrow if requested. The parties understand that conveyance, mortgage, and other recordable documents must be executed, acknowledged, and delivered in original form and will not be acceptable if signed only electronically. Okay, so what they're saying is for the purchase contract, for the amendments, things of that nature, um, customer sat waiver, a a copy electronic signature or a copy of a of a you know a document that was signed is satisfactory unless escrow asks for an original. However, any documents that need to be recorded all have to be originals. That's why when you go for signing, you know, you gotta sign all those docs, right? So that, those are the originals that escrow needs in order to, um, to record the sale. Hey, Counterparts. Hey, sorry, I had a question. Yeah. You yeah. know when you were reading in between um, S3 and S4? Yeah. The housing part, What? where was that part at? Where, I'm sorry, where was that? Where were you reading when you you were in S three and then you read like a, a part in between and then you read S four after? S four is added by after the Oh, I, I read S four. Looking at the yeah. Oh, are you? What, oh, it doesn't have S four. S four is electronic. Oh, so S4 doesn't, in, it's not fair housing. No, I don't have it. Because that's. Oh. We're looking at the okay. so, <laughs> uh, so let me give you some background. Uh, on December 1st, Boy Association released a. I had a nightmare about this, Kent. I never. Uh, on December 1st, they released the notice no, I have for, uh, updated here. purchase contract. Oh. And annotated or highlighted what the changes were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I said, I told you guys two weeks ago, is they had only annotated or highlighted. Yes, that one word. So what, what happened last night in the middle of the night is I went, you know what? I never compared the page by page to see if that was true. I just assumed that they're annotated copy. Because what they should be doing is any new additions, they should have highlighted them in orange. 
So I sent out the annotated version yesterday in the email. I bet she'll be important. I'm sorry. I have, a, I have the old one printed then. Yeah. Okay. So clearly they made other copies and they didn't annotate them correctly. But you know what's funny? This one does not have chapter. You need a copy of it. The, that, the old one does. Thanks, Lynn. I was trying to do it too. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? Is this me? <laughs> I knew what it was. I just didn't. <laughs> yeah. And it's so weird. Oh, so just to let you know, and you don't want to keep, you, she kept her mouth shut because she knew she didn't have the new one. Essentially. <laughs> I said it to her. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually looking at that. I'm going to reprint that out. So, Lisa, this one does not have chapter in M1. Correct. But the annotated one had chapter inserted. Yes. So, it's supposed to be inserted, but it never made it to the final draft. Are you saying it's not in there? It's not in here. And that's the updated version. Wow. This is the one that Gary gave me. Like, unless he gave you the old one, but that's no, give you the one. no, because then it has one. Man, release twelve. Yeah, twelve twenty one. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Well, yours truly is trying to get on the standard form today. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll work on that. Okay. Uh, so where was I? Electronic uh, talked about that, right? Counterparts. So this purchase contract and any then the amendments and related documents may be executed in any number of counterparts and by different parties in separate counterparts. Each of these, when so signed, shall be deemed to be an original, and all of which taken together shall constitute one and the same document. This shall be binding upon all of the parties, notwithstanding that all of the parties do not sign the original or the same counterpart. So basically it's saying that, you know, buyer can sign one copy, seller can sign another company, copy, and then combined, it's a fully executed contract, right? So sometimes when time is of the essence in terms of trying to get something done, like it's competitive, whatever it is, uh, I may tell the other side, just have your client sign it, send it to me. All of my clients sign at the same time and we'll send it back to you. So then we can do it in counterpart, right? So in that way, I'm not waiting for theirs, for my client to sign, to accept. I'm just going to do it at the same time and we'll just swap. And then combined, you will have a fully executed contract. Okay. Um, complete agreement. This purchase contract constitutes the entire agreement between buyer and seller and supersedes and cancels any and all prior negotiations, representations, warranties, understandings, or agreements, both written and oral of buyer and seller. No variation or amendment of this purchase contract should be valid or enforceable unless it is in writing and signed by both buyer and seller. All agreements and representations about the property must be set forth in writing, and the parties agree that to be effective, any representation or warranty made by brokerage firm or any party of this purchase contract must be set forth, forth in writing in this purchase contract or an amendment to this purchase contract or in any required disclosure statement. Bar and seller shall hold harmless and release the brokerage firms from any claims based on any alleged representation, which is not set forth in writing as stated in this paragraph. Now, I hear what this thing says. I'll be very cautious about that. It's saying that unless it's in writing, it doesn't exist. I don't necessarily agree because if, like let's say you represent the seller and the seller says something to the buyer and it, and it goes south on you, I, I'm sure the buyer will go back and say, you know, seller told me this, which ended up not being true. Even though it's not on the disclosure statement, even though it's not on the contract, whatever it is. And you know what? They may have a case. Right. So what it says here is it's got to be in writing. All I'm saying is be careful. If people say stuff that could come back at some point down the road, if there's ever a complaint and it may resurface and it could work against either party, quite honestly. Okay, buyer agrees to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, page 14, buyer agrees to buy the property at the price and terms offered in this purchase contract and acknowledges the receipt of a copy of this purchase contract. So make sure you give a copy to your client after they signed. Okay, and then it's either acceptance, counter offer, or reject under uh, section T. 
Okay. Just two things I see in the last couple of pages. Oh, the, the bottom, yeah. Is the section T, when you guys generate counter offers, you receive one from the other agent, or even an acceptance. You need to make sure that that has been checked appropriately for acceptance, counter offer, or rejection. Mm -hmm. Rejection is only required. Uh, a, a signature at the bottom of the contract is only required by the other broker if it's a rejection. Um, but you will have the other agent on the other side ask you to get your broker to sign the bottom. And if I'm your bit, I will just sign it just to be nice. Um, some brokers will go, that's not required. I don't have to sign it. Yeah. So that is really an HRS. It's going to be rejection where the broker at the bottom of this page needs to sign where it says review by. Um, the other thing I see most often missed in these is um, who the seller is. The disclosure section of the MLS for R6. And what I'll see agents do is, and it's a clear sign you haven't read or learned the purchase contract, is so they'll put in something like proper disclosure statement. Because that's what's listed in the multiple listing service. So, so we're, what, what section are you talking about? A, okay. yeah, R6A disclosure is only for licensees related to buyer or seller. Yeah. And you do need to read the MLS and see if the listing agent is related to the parties because you need to fill that in under offer. So it's not only if you're related to the buyer, but when you read the MLS that says list or is related to the seller, you need to put that in R6A. So those are common mistakes I see in contracts. By the way, experienced agents as well as new agents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when you look at the contract and you know, we talk about best practices, um, more so new agents, but experienced agents as well. You know, they, they have bad habits, right? Some of them just have bad habits. They don't, they're not very thorough. So, and it's never bitten them in the butt. So they just keep, missing or omitting that information. Um, what about the seller is a foreign person, Hawaii resident or non-Hawaii resident, owner, occupant, or other, Lisa? Does that get missed too? It gets missed. And, you know, I'm not sure. This is written below the seller's signature. I'm sorry, it's written um, yeah, below, below the buyer's signature. So no, below it seller. It shouldn't be something that the selling agent, by the way, selling agent is buyer's agent. It isn't something that the selling agent should be filling out because you're making a representation for the seller's position. Um, it's still going to be verified in escrow. Yeah. It's not going to make it, um, that is not going to make the contract binding or not binding, checking that box. So I'm less concerned about it. It's more of what, a heads up? Okay. Just to confirm, you said broker signs the rejection. Yeah, you see the bottom of page yes. 14. Yeah. So what will happen is you know, you'll write an offer, or let's say you get an offer on your listing, and then you accept it or you counter offer it. And the other TC on the other side will say, we need your broker to sign the bottom of page 14. Well, we don't because it was accepted, uh, or it's countered and accepted. So we don't need to. That's really only provide, required by, by, by statutes um, for rejection. But frankly, we ought to be reviewing it on both sides, and I have no problem signing it. They would have made it really simple to just say, for rejected offers, broker yeah. signature needed. <laughs> uh, other states have done that, but we'll get there. Yeah. So it's, it's not normal then when you're putting in offers and they're not giving you a response or um, rejection signature signing off. That's like... So you so let me think, Clay, are you saying if you participate in multiple offers and you never hear anything back and you never get a signature? Yeah. Very common. And I run into it and, and I, you know, I was raised here, but I have a little bit of California in me. So I can be a little witchy. And I will say, you know, as a prior by who I work by statutes, we need your broker to sign this. So I don't have to do that. I am the broker. And we're not, we're not counting your offer. So it is a problem. They're violating outside the law. And the question comes just like I say somebody's speeding down the highway. You know, they're doing something wrong, but it doesn't mean they're going to get caught. Um, oh. But they are supposed to provide it. I think the way we best model amazing, competent agent behavior is by us doing the right thing and modeling that in the marketplace. So if you're going to have six offers on your listing and you're only accepting one and you're not going to put another in backup position, then what you ought to do is get your broker to sign all five offers and return it to the other side so that we can show the rest of the community how professionalism looks. So no longer needs um, a rejection signature by seller. 
just a broker. No, seller doesn't have to do that because there was never a requirement before. Um, but what we would do is just- I think it's better to have the seller do it the line. Yeah, we just line it and say reject it and then just have them sign. And then we and just send it back. It's easier than getting the broker to sign it. But if you don't return it, you have to buy the, the seller. Then the other broker and the buyer have a right to say, I need to sign by a broker. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. the common complaint is always, I don't know if my offer was even presented. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a concern. Correct. They just want to be treated fairly and they want proof of that. Yeah. I mean, and we should have all of these documents, by the way. I know it's not done in common practice, but especially the better you get at your own. Um, Clients management inside of uh, command. There's a specific function in command where you can upload and annotate and compare all the offers you receive. And you can even invite the client into the transaction and share that information. If you do that, and there was ever a complaint or a lawsuit over any of these situations or even a ethics violation charge, we would be able to show in command that all of those offers were uploaded. And it's a great thing to have the seller sign rejected. Yep. It's easy enough to do on DocuSign if you're not meeting in person. Yep. Okay, so um, we'll switch gears now. What I'll do is I'll pull the contract up. I don't know how to do that, I'll but do somebody can help me pull it up. <laughs> if, you, if you have permitted me to do it, I have it already. Yes, please. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just go through that. Um, but before we start, any, any final questions you guys might have in Zoom land or in person? Any questions? Okay, if not, let me set the stage then. So I'll say that I'm meeting with a client to review, uh, to submit an offer. Uh, they've, they've been on showings, they've seen multiple homes. Um, I would ask them, how would you rate it, right? I would ask them out of a scale of one to 10, because the expectation is we're gonna write an offer out of a scale of one to 10, what would you rate this? So I have some sense as to, how important this it is to them. Um, leading up to this, I would call the seller's agent. I would make sure that I understand when offers are due. So the question would be, are you gonna review all at once? Or are you gonna review as they come in? Two diff totally different responses um, that, that I'm gonna have to go through. If, if it's being presented as they come, then I'm telling my buyer, you know, the sooner the better, because we don't want to lose because we're late. But if there's a stated due date, I would confirm that. Oh, I see an MLS offers are due by Monday. When are you presenting? Right. Um, the other thing I would ask the seller's agent in preparation. So let's say that I know they want to offer on ABC Main Street. I'm going to call and say, you know, Mr. Seller's agent, besides price, what's important to the seller? What's important to you? And hopefully they'll share a little bit. I mean, it might be that, you know, they want a, a longer close date because they got to move out. Uh, it might be that they don't want to deal with cleaning. It might be where they want to leave behind stuff, you know, especially if they have an older client. Uh, it might be where they say, you know what? We don't want any requests through J1, but you need to know, understand how to play that one. But maybe they might say oh, it's an older client. They don't want the stress. So you just never know, right? You never know. So it doesn't hurt to ask in a nice way. Um, and I also try to understand what's important to the seller's agent as well. Because it's not just the seller who's making this decision. Some sellers are not making a decision. Some agents are making decisions for their sellers, which is not right, but you know, sometimes that's what happens. So I try to understand what, you know, what's the relationship if, if they're willing to share. Okay, so now I have an understanding, right? Uh, they like what, um, ABC Main Street. Um, I'll sit down with them. I'll go through comps, try to peg a number. Um, and I'll go through this contract with them to explain uh, what they're gonna be offering to the seller. Okay, so we're sitting down or you're zooming either way, uh, but I'm gonna say, okay, and, I'll, and my best practice or what I like to do is I like to have the MLS next to me, whether it's electronic or on paper. 
because what I'm doing is I'm checking my work as I go. Okay. So, you know, this is a purchase contract. It's 14 pages long, legally binding once it's um, executed. Okay. So today is, what is today? The 15th or the 16th. So I'm saying, you know, uh, we're going to be submitting this today. So I have a reference date there. Address is one, uh, ABC Main Street. And then I'll talk about the TMK, which I'm looking at MLS or even the, um, what is that other? Yeah, yeah that other MLS. document just to confirm that, hey, what I put down there is matching uh, the other information. And then I'll say in this paragraph here, and I'll read this to them. This purchase contract becomes a legally binding contract for the purchase of real estate upon execution by the parties. Read it carefully. Handwritten or typed provisions in this purchase contract shall supersede any printed provisions if there is a conflict. For the null blanks, paragraphs preceded by a checkoff box are optional and must be checked to be part to be made part of this purchase contract. Write NA if not applicable. So I'm telling them, you know, anytime you see bold, it's important. So I read that to them, let them know, hey, it's important. So it's legally binding. Uh, we got to check the boxes if we want it to apply. We'll put NA if it doesn't apply. Um, and if we write anything in there, it'll super supersede whatever is printed. Okay. And then agency, I'll just say, and again, this is a kind of an edited version, right? I'm not going to talk for two hours on this contract. I'm trying to hit the high points. Um, and I'm trying to explain it to them in a way that they can understand it. Right. So Regarding the agency, um, we're represent, representing you. So Kelly Williams Honolulu is representing you as a buyer's agent. Um, and we all, our duty is, is, to, is to you. So we all, the highest duty is to you, the buyer, including confidentiality, loyalty, and due care and diligence, right? Um, I'll say who the seller is represented by. So seller has been, been represented by uh, one, two, three firm. Um, then I go to section B. So sometimes they'll bring a checkbook with them. Uh, sometimes they'll want to just send it into escrow or I'll pick it up from them. It just depends on how busy they are, how mobile they are, uh, or maybe they want to wire it in, which I'm a little cautious about, right? Because of all this wiring stuff that goes on. So I'm going to ask the buyer. So are you going to write me a check? Do you want to deposit it in escrow or do you want to wire the funds? Okay. And then I'll let them know that. So today is, what is it? Thursday, right? So I'll say, okay. So today's Thursday. We're going to write the offer. I talk to the agent. They're going to submit as they come. So we want to write this up, get it signed off. And by the way, you know, our broker has already signed off on this. So I kind of filled out everything except for maybe price. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be submitting it and we'll give them, um, and I'll recommend like maybe a day or two days, depending on how much pressure we want to put on the seller, right? Um, so maybe to be nice, we give them three days. If you want to put pressure on them, maybe we give them 24 hours. Just depends. And it also depends on where the seller is. If the seller's on the mainland, they might have to give them more time. If they're here and accessible, maybe less time. So that'd be another question that I'd ask the seller's agent. Um, when we submit, is it pretty, is, is the seller pretty easy to get a hold of? Will they review fairly quickly? You know, those kinds of things kind of, kind of play into how much time you want to give them. Okay. Then I go through the purchase price. I said, so I'll talk to them about your initial deposit. So we'll put a um, thousand down, we'll put down 5,000 additional. And then on there, we'll say, um, We'll let them finish their conversation. Uh, so additional deposit due into escrow, um, two business days after J1, as an example. So I'll let them know if we pass J1, which is the home inspection, I'll explain it to you a little bit later, um, your additional deposit will be due in escrow. Okay. Um, balance of down payment, total cash, and then they'll be borrowing X amount and then total purchase price. Now, when I'm going through those numbers, what is, I want to make sure that when we talk about cash funds, 
that is liquid, right? That is accessible, that it's not from their IRA or it's not in a place where they've got to jump through a lot of hoops to pull that money out. Um, I've seen transactions in the past where the buyer's agent didn't understand how to get the money out. They relied on the client to tell them and it just delayed closing like for a couple of weeks because they tried to pull it out of an IRA and it just, it took a long time. Um, and then with regard to any lending, right? Um, I, I tell them that, you know, when we submit an offer, there, there, are, there are three parties involved in, in terms of a team. It's you, the buyer, me, the realtor, and the lender. If there's a weak link in any of those three, it could be a challenge. So I, I want to make sure that if they have their own lender, that I've talked to the lender, that I'm, that I'm pretty comfortable with who the lender is and the lender is experienced. Um, because you don't know where this lender is going to come from. It could be a mainland lender. It could be their best friend who is a lender who does no transactions at all. I've had that. My buyer said, my friend is going to be the lender. I called the lender and was not satisfied. So in a nice way, I told my client, I said, you know, Sharon, the whole thing, right? All three of us have to be involved. So, you know, she doesn't do a lot, of, a lot of volume. I'm concerned that if she doesn't perform, you may not be able to buy this house if she can't fulfill her obligation as a, as a loan officer. So in a nice way, just making sure that you're setting your buyer up for success. Go ahead. So with like a gift or a gift, I'm sorry. You know, if somebody's like father is giving them a sizable. Um, yeah, it's it's on here. I'll, I'll cover that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, buyer should should buyer fail to make any make the additional. I'm sorry. Should buyer fail to make the initial earnest money deposit or additional deposit when due, seller may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph 01. So same thing in bold, read it to them. Let them know that as a buyer, there's only a few ways that the seller can cancel on you, right? Financing, lack of deposits, either initial or additional, right? And especially in this kind of a market where guys are outbidding each other. If you don't, if, you're, if your timing is off and you don't deliver your additional, the seller has the right to cancel on you and go to the next guy because maybe the next guy is back up higher than you, right? So just be aware, right? You don't want to be the one going, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize they could do that. Um, addenda, so I'll let them know which addendas, uh, addendums we've included on there, and I'll tell them I'll, I'll cover that after. So I won't, I'll just say, okay, we're going to add an as is, we're going to add um, a Keller Williams standard addendum, and I'll cover that at the end. Um, tax map, we've covered that. Um, I'll give the description. You know, it's a you know single family home, three bedroom, one bath, blah, 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 blah. Inclusions, I'll get the MLS out again. And I'll say, this sale includes, and I'll, ex and I'll um, compare my notes, right? I'll say it includes split air, it includes a dishwasher, it includes a dryer, a washer, and that's all includes. And so I'm com comparing my notes to make sure that I cover everything that's in MLS that I wrote down in this contract, just to double check, right? And to the buyer, they're thinking, wow, you're pretty thorough. But really it's just being thorough, yes, but I'm also checking my work. Um, if there's any inclusions, so photovoltaic or alarms, um, they'll be checked off. Now, if there's a photovoltaic system or a security alarm system and it's leased, not being purchased, then make sure that you get copies of that, and that's another way that you as a buyer can cancel on this contract on the seller. Normally, there's not going to be inclusions of furnishings. That's pretty rare. Um, sometimes there's ex exclusions because they want that mirror that's hanging, and they don't want it to be an issue um, at, at closing, right? So they'll include inclusion, exclusions. Then I'll say closing, right? Um, it'll be the day that the bureau records the transaction. Typically, we'll get called about 8.30 in the morning. So when we close, I'll get called and be notified by escrow. And then I'll call you to congratulate you and determine when I can meet you to give you the keys. 
scheduled closing date. So I, I'm not sure what the standard is now, but I, I heard that you, you shouldn't put 45 days or sooner. Is that the case? Uh, so anyway. Yeah, like here's the problem with saying or sooner is that it's not a definite date. You know, we talked about the four, con the four corners of the contract yeah. rule. It's already assumed to be o or sooner, meaning by mutual agreement. You'd have to have mutual agreement anyway. Yeah. If you say or sooner, it could imply that if one party can close sooner, you will. So, okay. Well, so I think if you want to communicate, you want to close sooner, you'd say 45 days or sooner by mutual consent. And that would communicate to a seller if you'd like to close okay. sooner. Okay. But I would just put or sooner. Okay. So, by mutual consent. So, basically, right, if, if that 45th day ends on a day that the Bureau of Conveyances is closed, you can't record. So if you put 45 days and it falls on that date, it's the next business day when the bureau is open. Or if you say, or sooner by mutual consent, then it'll be earlier. And why is that important? Well, if it falls on a Saturday or a Sunday um, and you close on a Monday, you're, you know the lender funds the loan and it extends the amount of time escrow holds that money. So now the buyer is paying a couple of extra days of interest. So the simplest way to look at it is if I don't, if I, if I close three days after it funds, I pay three days of financing charges. And let's say that it's a, uh, you know, uh, $200 a day in interest that I pay per day. Right. Then I pay $600. But if uh, the lender funds on a, when, uh, on a Wednesday or Thursday, but doesn't close till Monday, that's another two days. And if you're paying $200 a day, that's 400 additional dollars that now the buyer is paying because we closed on a day where the lender had to fund and car carry it through the weekend. So I don't know if I'm confusing you or not, but it costs more to do that. No, no, because they need the, they need everything while they're working, right? So the, the money has to come into escrow. They have to package the information, which then goes to the bureau, and then the bureau will 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 record it, thus giving uh, acknowledging the sale, right? So if uh, so, so no, on the weekend, none of that happens. Yeah. So the it's called a good funds law. And different states have different rules. So California, the good funds law is the day before recordation. So what it means is that the escrow holder has to have in-state cash equivalent funds two business days prior to the date that the bureau will record it. And that means the funds from the lender and the funds from the buyer. So the lender will deliver the funds, let's say on Friday closing, the lender must deliver the funds to escrow Wednesday in time for the deposit. And the buyer has to do the same. And that's going to be by a wire from a Hawaii bank or a cashier's check. I'm sorry, a wire that lands on that date. Or, or a cashier's, cashier's check. check local bank. bank. Yep. So you don't have any flexibility in that because it's business days, period. And you are coordinating. So you can sign documents on the weekend. But the bank is only going to process them at the lending institution on a business day. So if you, if you find on a Friday, close on a Friday. No. no, there has to be two business, business days, days before recordation oh. and Saturday and Sunday are business days. So here's what, what um, we're looking at this is let's say you just happen to have an odd, I'm trying to think of an odd holiday to do this. Um, I'll tell you uh, one of the things that I, I would suggest you do, and I brought this specifically today, is you know, I have my agents do this and I've been hired by other companies to do this through your advanced calendar for your planning purposes. The first thing I always do with my year class calendar is I go to the Bureau of Advances or the reporter's office in California, and I mark with a red dot or a purple dot or something all of the reporting holidays. Because when I now sit with my client, I can take a, a screenshot of this or I can put it in my day planner. When I go to write the offer, I can see the dates that the Bureau is closed and the holidays, right? So I don't want to have a situation where there's two days closed in a row and you have to fund two business days before, and let's just say for the sake of yes, Friday's a holiday and Monday's a holiday. Now you're gonna to have to fund on Thursday and close on Wednesday. So now you're paying Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday interest instead of two days. 
It's usually going to be like, like you said, four instead of two, but it can be expensive. And you get clients that are annoyed over $75. Imagine what they're going to be if it's a few hundred, right? Yeah. Because a lot of times emotions take hold of us. Yeah. I am a much bigger fan of putting dates firm in a purchase contract because clients can plan on it. What messes that up is two things. F3A, the unilateral right to extend, because yep. that moves it by a specific number of days or, or a portion of those. And the other thing is, you know, if, if you can't get it to happen in that time, you're going to have to come in the contract with them. Yeah, because sometimes when you submit the offer over, it takes time for response. You go back and forth and you lose two or three days. And all of a sudden, from a 45 day closing, now it's 42 or 41. Run out of time. So the negotiation is a sticky on days. No, because you, you no, what he's saying is if you pick a date certain, you have to know when the counter offer takes time that you have to keep your eye on the ball as far as changing the date of the counter offer as well. Because if it's 45 days, it moves with the acceptance date. But you may have a situation where somebody's having a baby or they have to have their belongings off of a booty truck on a certain date. So knowing that and planning on the calendar and knowing your dates here is then you can customize it for that. What Ken's saying is if you don't do the 45 days and you go back and forth, my worst counter offer was a house in Senegal, 13 counter offers. It took us so long to negotiate the deal that by the time the escrow, I'm sorry, by the time we got into escrow, the whole weather pattern had changed. So, and then we found that we had some other problems. I'll take guys to be sorry about it. But so in those time frames, we had to constantly count on the closing date as well because the business practice was the exact date. Yeah. So just be aware, if a 45 days or 30 days, when you write the offer, sit with your client, have a day planner or your phone open and say, if it gets together within the next 24 hours, this would be a closing date. But know that that's going to move out by every number of days that we spend negotiating this well, and you and you have to change F2. So on your counter, right, you have to anticipate how long it's going to take for them to respond. And you're going to have to change F2 on your counter to make sure that you have adequate time to close. Yeah. Many times you forget about changing F2. You're more concerned about all the other terms that you're trying to negotiate. So, um, so 45 days is, from that perspective, the easiest to deal with. Um, but if you go with a set date, it's easier for the clients to focus on that. But you need to make sure that you're moving that date if negotiations are taking too long. Okay. Okay. So I explained to them the closing date. I'll let them know that there is one right to extend unilateral. Um, it does, and it doesn't say what the reasons are. And we talked about that, I think, in one of the first classes about some guys using it up, taking one day. And just burning that whole thing, right? So, Lisa, you know, regarding that, there is Better Homes has a addendum that says if if it's ten days and one party uses only one day, the other party has the right to use the other, the other yeah, nine. And, so, and that's how this contract used to be written. It was modified, I think, about three or four years ago. <clears throat> so, if you get that Better Homes and Gardens amendment, be aware of that. Oh, they changed it. Yeah. Yeah, but but what you can also do because. I, it sounded as though um, agents are being taken advantage of, right? They would burn it and they wouldn't need it. They weren't really doing it in good faith, which then allowed, uh, which, which then um, didn't allow the other agent to extend if they needed. Right. So, what would be the point? Well, I'll give you two examples. Um, the first one we had happen with, uh, gosh, I think it was Audrey, and she had a client that went to the property early before home inspection her buyer. Audrey door knocked to get this listing. It was an agent from Polo Maker that owned it. The client showed up early and unplugged all the ring cameras of the, that belonged to the seller so that they couldn't watch or listen in on the property inspection. And that buyer was another one that was working with mainland people and thought he was smarter than everybody. And um, the seller saw them unplug the ring cameras and got mad and knew that the buyer simultaneously was saying, I need an extension on my loan approval because we're not going to make it. So she did a one day extension of F3A and burned his other 13 days. So he could, and, and they had made their loan approval 
based, you know, the final load approval is based on number of days before closing. So they were going to use the 14 day extension to give them 13 days to get the final loan approval. What she did is she gave a one day initiated by the seller, you know, I will write to extend and extinguish the other 13 days. And then she kicked the buyer out of contract for failing to get the loan. Did she, did she get the the uh, right. And there's more to those stories too. I mean, I write a book on the real yeah. stories of real estate. He ended up buying it through a shell buyer later. Mm -hmm. but interesting character. Yeah. So um, the other one was um, I've actually used it in a case where if the seller used it, we found out if the seller had used it, it would have extended the time frame for our loan past the lock date. So we needed to extinguish it so that it didn't cost my clients another $2,500 in extending their rate. So we burned it by two days or one day so that we would force the close of escrow to be not extended by the seller and cost us. Because look, if the seller extends it and you put 12 or 14 days in there or 10 days and your client now has to pay for an extended loan lock, that's on you. That's why you should be working with your lender very closely in all these terms, just like Ken said. This is not something you go right in a vacuum with your buyer without consulting with the lender, but they can make the loan approval time frames and closing time frames. Yeah. So yep. for a federal home, um, the lender that they can you could just still burn the goods on that day. Well, the difference is if no, they change the gardens it. addendum is in play. What it says is that if one party uses a part of the unilateral right to extend, then either party can use the rest of it. Yeah, yes. but if I'm gonna like screen that way, I'm gonna burn all of it. Well, not in my case, we burned one day. And if, if, if it was done this way, <clears throat> if that seller on Audrey's deal had initiated on a BHG addendum one day extension, our buyer yeah. still would have had the other 13. No, but why wouldn't they just take all the then that would have extended my client's ability oh, to work with their loan yeah, contents the yeah. time. Okay, yeah, so so it, it could it could be done that way for a number of reasons. Um, all I'm saying is that I heard it became an, it was an issue at yeah. one point, and so if you're concerned about that, then look at that addendum that um, Better Homes and Garden has, and use the same language in your Connor offer, which then states that if only a part of it is used, and the other part can still be is still in play. By either party. Well, it is either. It, no, it can be. It just, it just depends. It, it just depends, right? So that's why anytime you ask a question of um, a broker or an agent, they'll say, "Who do you represent?" Because they're always trying to understand what's the orientation here, right? So, yeah, it all depends. So for F three, it's going to be. So I'll explain that, and I'll say um, F three B doesn't apply because we. There is, an, uh, uh, there is a one-time right to extend. Escrow, if the uh, seller is saying, you know, use this escrow officer and we want to be nice, then we'll use that or we'll put in our own. I would say uh, prorations and our closing adjustments are based on a 30-day proration schedule. So for things such as maintenance fees or property taxes, know that they'll just go and base it on um, you know, whatever that monthly amount is, 30 days, they'll take that percentage and that's how they'll figure out um, what to what to charge you and what to um, credit back the seller. Closing costs as a buyer, you pay 40% of title insurance. That's F6. Seller pays 60%. Escrow fees are shared 50-50. And I, I share with buyer that, you know, roughly it's about 1% of, of the sales price. Right, roughly. If it's a much higher price property, it would be less than that. If it's an inexpensive property, it could be a little more than that. Yeah, for F6, right? So that does not include things such as um, home inspections, their lending fees, points. This is strictly for escrow, okay? F7, proper, uh, conveyance tax, I'll confirm you're buying it as a principal residence, right? Check that box. Um, F8, assessment. So I'll say, if there's any lump sum assessment, we're gonna check uh, seller. So especially if it's a condo, right? And there's a known assessment. We wanna make sure that we're, that one, 
uh, if they're aware of it, the seller has already priced that in and the seller will, will pay for that. And then for B, any installments, it could either be seller pays or prorated. It just depends on how much is left and what the uh, buyer is willing to accept. Um, what might be fair is prorated, but if it's a number that's really high and the seller is def desperate to sell, maybe put it on the seller. And then I'll say C is if there's a new assessment, right? That's kind of, kind of like a new disclosure. So if there's a new assessment, they'll need to disclose that. Uh, you, you have, if you're not satisfied with that, you will have the right to cancel the contract and get your money back. So I try to impress upon the buyer, especially if they haven't written an offer yet, especially if they're a little, uh, not shy, but you know, they're not confident. Uh, I let them know that this contract as a buyer, you have many more ways to cancel than the seller has. So you kind of want to be on the table um, with the acceptance, with the ability to cancel versus other way around, which is, gosh, I wish I had put my best foot forward because I really do like that property now, right? Um, risk of loss passes to buyer upon closing or buyer's possession of the property, whichever occurs sooner. So I, I explained that to them because, you know, come down towards the last week of the escrow and they say, hey, Ken, I'm going to order appliances and the house is vacant. We close on Friday, but I want to have them deliver it on Wednesday so I can install it on, on, on Saturday, you know, because they can't deliver on Thursday or Friday because they can't deliver over the weekend or whatever. So I point this out to them and I say, you know, this, if you have anything delivered, that could imply possession. If the house burns down, you may be then liable for that house, right? So I try to make it as clear as possible in terms of expectations and as clean as possible in terms of making sure there's no gray areas where, you know, the other side could then come back at us for some reason. Uh, keys to the property, um, one complete set of keys. Sometimes I'll write in there that I'll ask for two complete set of keys. Um, then I'll say there's a title report that you'll receive from escrow. So escrow will order from title a report that explains who the legal owner is, right? And it'll say that um, where, who the, where the liens are, anything that may um, limit your enjoyment of the property, things like uh, easements or, or whatever on that title report. So, so read that. Um, you have the right to review it. And then under G2B, if you're not satisfied with the report, you can cancel the contract. Okay, and it doesn't say why. This is if you're not satisfied, you can cancel. Under C, if there's a defect, we we'll give them the ability to cancel, I mean, to correct it. And if they, can't, if they can't correct it within X amount of time, again, you have the right to cancel, right? Because we want to make sure that when you close, you get it free and clear of all liens from the seller. You will have your own lien once you close. Okay, so your question earlier about Funds now, cash funds. So I'll ask them, is there any contingency on your cash funds? Do you have the money liquid? Because you said you're going to put $50,000 down. Do you have the $50,000? And I'll ask them where, where is that? And I'll even ask the lender, have you verified that, right? I want to make sure that we all know that the cash is available, it's easily uh, accessible and can be used in this transaction. Okay, so they'll say, yes, I have no contingency, or they'll say, no, I do have a contingency. I've, I've got to do a HELOC, or I, gotta, I need gift funds, something of that sort, right? So then that goes to two, H2. So here it'll say, your contingency is obtaining gift funds. You check the box. And then there's a form that the lender has, which then they can give to the buyer, your client, and say, okay, I need this in order to give it to my um, underwriter to confirm that you have adequate cash to be able to purchase this property. So does having that verification of funds mm -hmm. paper when they put in the offer, does it matter as much? You know, I, like if you are gonna make an offer mm -hmm. and you have to say, well, Produce verification of my mm -hmm. two to three days. Mm -hmm. But if you had it before, does it make it any stronger? If you had it before, yeah. 
No, I mean, if, if no. So, so in, in reference to um, proof, right? It does say satisfactory to seller. So when you submit, right? Just make sure that it's from a reliable source that you're providing this proof. Because I guess if you were looking at five offers and this one said, oh yeah, I'm getting a gift from my dad, but they haven't, they don't- I, I, would, I would trust it from the lender. Because if I got a handwritten note or a type, it doesn't matter. If I got a note from the buyer that said, I'm um, buyer's dad, that, oh, I'm lending Ken 50000 to buy this property. I, I don't know, Ken. I don't know the dad, right? But I do know a bank. I know Bank of Hawaii or I know American Savings Bank or I know, you know, the lender. And the lender's verifying that, hey, uh, we have proof of uh, funds and we also have... Um, we have a gift funds um, commitment letter. So it's as good as now the lender's word and as good as the buyer's parents' word that that money will come over. So the lender will probably say, okay, yes, you're going to lend them the money. Show me proof that you have the money to lend them. And as long as the money comes over, then you're good, right? But it's a contingency. So meaning that, you know, I, I'm saying I can do it, and you hope that I can do it, but it's still a contingency. It's not a guarantee, right? So you check that box off, make sure that, so if, if it is a, um, a gift fund, a gift um, fund from the buyer, I'm already talking to the lender saying, line that up for me because I got to disclose that, right? So I'll check off whatever I need to have um, disclosed and I'll at work with the lender to line up proof that the buyer can deliver on these contingencies for H2. Okay, now I'll say H3, your purchase is contingent on you getting a loan. So unless this is a, a cash buyer, I'm telling the buyer you're getting a loan and it's contingent upon you getting the loan. If you can't get the loan, you don't have to buy the property. Okay, so you're protected there, right? H4, you do have obligations, however, okay? You need to provide a uh, pre prequal or pre-approval. You know, when I submit, I would want a pre-approval, not a pre-qualification. You guys all understand the difference, right? Um, and then it says X amount of days prior to closing, lender will provide a um, um, conditional, and then soon after that, provide final and approval. And, you know, conditional would be all the conditions that can't be satisfied earlier. Um, and those are the conditions that the lender needs or underwriting needs to be fulfilled in order to, to provide final loan approval. Things such as um, job employment verification. That's one of the biggest ones, right? They want to make sure that if they fund that loan, the buyer is still employed. I've heard of... Uh, one instance where the buyer lost their job right before closing. And guess what? Cannot buy. The lender is not going to fund the loan. Buyer has no way of paying it back if they don't have a job. So they're protected. Because again, I said earlier that if the buyer can't get the loan, they don't have to buy the house or the condo. Okay, get their money back. Um, then I go, I want to go as a, as a seller, they are obligated based on Hawaii, uh, Hawaii law to disclose what they know about the property. So it'll be in the form of a five page seller's disclosure statement. So they'll provide it to you, I'll give it to you. You read it, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, and then you'll have X amount of days upon receipt to review and to accept that. Or if you find something out that you don't like about the property, you have the ability to cancel. Okay, so that's what that disclosure statement is for. So I explain that to them. Then under general disclosure, I'll say that, you know, besides that, right, there are other disclosures such as building permits, mold disclosure, asbestos. So if you're sensitive to any of those things, for the test for it, that's, that's your right. right. If you see something where you're thinking, you know, maybe a hazardous mold condition, then you can test for that. Okay. 
I just want to point out that we had this discussion during the contract class what, three, three weeks ago. We got hazardous waste. I think it was two days later, the petroleum spill in the water. Oh. Where we had this discussion, I was like, ah, we chased it. Oh, gosh, it's not resolved. <laughs> Hope they resolve that. But yeah. So I'll just go quickly over all the other um, disclosures. All right. Then J1. I'll say that. You know, you have the right to do your home inspection or to do your inspections, I should say, not home inspection, your inspections to include a home inspection. Now, if they're buying a house with a pool, we want a pool inspection. If they're buying a house with gas, you want a gas inspection. If the home is more than 50 years old, it's a single family home, you probably want to scope the sewer line, right? Because that could be super expensive to fix if down the road there's a tree that cracked it open is now stopping the sewage from flowing out and it's backing up in the house. So I explained that, you know, from the, from acceptance state, we have a 10 day J1 period. Do you have a home inspector that, that you'd like to use? So for the inspections, home inspection, terminal inspection, pool, whatever, handyman, contractor, I'm always asking them first, do you have somebody that you would like to use, right? And if they say no, They'll say, well, we have some that we've used in the past. If you'd like to use them, we, we, you, can, you can use them. I try to avoid, I recommend this guy or recommend that guy, right? Because then it's on me, right? So I'll just say, we've used them before and our clients have been happy. So from the time that it's accepted, we've asked for a 10-day J1. And keep in mind, we're writing the offer. We're going to be submitting this to the seller. So I'm telling the buyer, this is our request to the seller, a 10-day J1. Remember now, this is our request. The seller can counter us and reduce it down to seven days or five days, whatever it is. That way, they don't walk away from this meeting going, oh, yeah, I have 10 days if accepted. Not necessarily, right? If accepted, yes. If countered, maybe not. So um, I'll say that if accepted and we have 10 days, then we want to do the inspection as quickly as possible. So these are the guys, right? And then they'll say, yes. Okay, so um, we'll make the calls. We'll arrange access. We'll arrange the inspections to happen. We want you to be available for the summary. That way you can see condition of the home. Because how long have you spent in that home so far? Oh, let's see. We went to open house on Sunday. We were there about an hour. Okay. Have you checked all the appliances? Have you looked at the roof? Have you called under the house? So try to give some perspective to them because when they see a house that they, that they like or they love, they gloss over everything, right? They don't really know exactly the condition. And so that's our, our role. That's what this paragraph is for. This section is for to make sure that the buyer knows what they're buying. So the best of the inspector's ability, right? So I explained it to them. Um, I'll let them know that seller needs to keep the property in the same condition as when you saw it doing your home inspection, inside and out. So if when you saw it, the lawn was nicely manicured, better be the same way when we do our walkthrough. Okay. So I'm just explaining what to expect. We will do our final walkthrough five days or four days or three days prior to close. At that point, be in the same condition as when we did our inspection. Right. Um, and then we'll just quickly test whatever we can just to make sure that it's all in good condition. I've I've seen where like a washing machine wasn't working. So then, you know, the seller would have to repair it. Right. And I, I tell the buyer that if it's not in the same condition, or we find damage or something of that sort. This contract says that we have the right to withhold 150 percent of the estimated value for that repair. Keep in mind that. Both parties have to agree. So just because we say it's going to cost 500 to repair the, the um, stove, doesn't mean that the seller will agree to the withholding of $1,000 if they don't do it by the date that they said they would do it by. Okay? Both parties still have to agree. So in, in, the, in discussing the, the contract, I try to explain to the buyer that it may sound like we have the right to just tell escrow and escrow will hold it. That's not how it works. Both parties have to agree. So in the event that 
it, were, it, it became an issue and we had a conflict about the withholding. Hopefully the buyer remembers my comment about it's not a guarantee. Both parties have to agree. So a lot of this stuff has to still be negotiated. Um, they'll say, you know, we'll ask for warranties in their J7. We'll ask them to remove uh, personal items from the property. We'll ask them to clean. There were no pets, so we're not gonna ask for pet treatment. Okay. I don't know if that, is it moving? Yes, it's moving now. So turning the page, so let's say it's a single family home on page nine. Uh, we're gonna ask for a survey. We want the survey to de be delivered to us, let's say no later than 15 days after acceptance. Sometimes that's, that's easy for the seller's agent to deliver, sometimes not. It depends on when they order the survey. Then I'll explain that um, when we get the survey, we'll look at it, we'll walk the property. We want to see where the pins are. We want to see if there's any encroachments. So under K3, if there is an encroachment, right, you have three things that you can ask. You can ask for the removal of the, of the encroachment. You can ask for um, an agreement to be made between both owners, current owners, um, or you can accept it, right? You can, ask for, you can do any of those three things. Now, if you ask for the encroachment agreement and they can't deliver it to you, then you have the right to cancel the contract, okay? So walk the property, show them the encroachments, um, determine if it's gonna be a big deal or not. You know, sometimes these old, primarily the older homes, right? They'll, they'll have walls that, that sag, or maybe they were built a long time ago, they're not sagging, but they weren't built on one property only. They kind of zigzag. They've been that way for 50, 60, 70 years. So trying to put it into perspective for the, uh, for the buyer is helpful, yeah. Then under section L, termite inspection, said you have the right to have it inspected for termites, right? So we're gonna fill it out as um, within five days of acceptance, we'll notify seller of who our termite inspector is, or a best practice might be to just include that in under section Q, we elect XYZ termite inspection company as our inspector. Okay, so the we'll, we'll say that you know it's competitive. So we'll say, okay, you buyer, you agree to pay for the inspection report. Or if the buyer goes, oh no, I don't want to pay for the whole thing. So okay, we can cap it. We'll cap it at five hundred dollars or six hundred dollars, and then the seller will pay pay for the rest of it, right? So the termite inspection is done typically fourteen days prior to close. And they'll send the deliver to you a termite inspection report. And the report will, will, will tell you any evidence of termite infestation. And it'll the inspectors will kind of notate on a drawing where they found evidence of termite infestation. Buyers, a seller's obligated to comply with the recommendation by the termite inspector. Okay, so the inspector may say. No evidence, so nothing. Termite inspector may say, on evidence, spot treat. Inspector may say, remove and replace. Or inspector may say, tent. This is where I, I, I explain that. Um, if that happens, right, and it's a it's home, right? We're talking about a home. Then seller at that point is scrambling to get a to get it tented. They want it, you as a buyer want it tented before it closes because if the termite company does any damage to the property, it becomes a new disclosure. Seller's still obligated to correct that. If they don't tent it and it's not a requirement of the lender and you close and then you tent it and then the termite company damages it, then it's on you. Okay. And know that these tenting companies is pretty standard. They take no uh, responsibility for damage. I also tell the buyer that if it's um, gutters or if it's an old roof, it might leak, you know, because they'll walk on it. And if it's an old single, old, old uh, asphalt shingle, or if it's a tiled roof, it could crack. Um, okay, so if it's tented, one is the time frames, 
I got to let them know about that. Um, two, I let them know that that tent is, is designed and the, the poison is designed to kill anything living in there, right? So it'll kill termites, it'll kill geckos, it'll kill roaches. So when the termite tent comes off, don't be surprised if they haven't cleaned it yet to see all these dead things in there. Also, when they put the tent over the house, if that tent is over any foliage, any plants, they're likely to die. That way, if it is tented, and that ornamental tree that is like right there in front of the house that they couldn't avoid is now dead. And the buyer's like, but I love that tree. What are they going to do? Nothing. It says it in the termite tent in agreement, right? And it says it in here as well. So those are things to kind of just pr prepare, right? Prepare the buyer for what could happen. So that if it does, they're not as upset about it if it's condos it could be re, um, replaced right remove and replace like a door or a cabinet because you can't you can't tent one unit only it's either spot treat remove and replace i don't think there are any more options they used to have some kinds of treatments that would be satisfactory but i don't know if there's any anymore that can just um, take care of um, drywood termites in a condo. So the other thing I, I do is I try to explain the difference between drywood termites and uh, ground termites. And the termite inspector will do a much better job at that because for a lot of people who don't understand termites, as soon as they hear it, they get all messed up. They're like, oh, my house is going to fall out. It's not true. Uh, drywood termites are very common. They're all over the place. You can't, you, you can't prevent them. They'll fly in, they'll nest up, they'll prey up, nest up. But they're very slow moving. They'll take months or years to even push out those pellets that you see. Ground termites. So th their colonies are in the hundreds. Ground termites, their colonies are in the millions. So they'll do damage in weeks or months. Right? So that's the difference. So uh, buyers need to understand that. I'm sorry? That's what houses get They get both. Uh, so ground termites, they need a water source. Uh, so typically that's why they come from the ground. Although I've heard of um, a termite nest, because they still fly and they nest, right? Because there was a leak in the AC unit or something. So there was a water source and there was a ground termite nest in the attic, not from the ground. Okay, section M, if it's a condo, I'm going to explain that you'll, you'll get all the condo docs. Please review them. It's important, right? It'll have house rules, what you can and can't do. Financials, how well is the building being run? And I kind of share with them what I might be looking for in terms of financials. I would like to see 3 to 5% increase in maintenance fees per year. I would not want to see zero. I would not want to see 10%. But three to five would be kind of like the average of inflation, right? I mean, maybe not now, but generally things go up in price. So to see it zero, that's the red flag. And to see it too high, that's another red flag. So um, please read those, okay? Same thing, right? We have 10 days from receipt. If you find anything that you see that you don't like, you can cancel the contract. I keep letting them know all the ways that they can get out of the contract. Okay, under page 11 and one and two. So either or, you can't check both. Uh, either they're gonna deliver possession free of, uh, free of tenants because it's not being rented or it'll be subject to a rental agreement. Yes? Yeah, yeah. How many? A year. A year. You do with, but uh, I mean, if it has a tenant already, let's just say you have a if you, you can't buy if there's a, okay. If you claim it as your primary residence, then it cannot be tenant occupied unless maybe just a portion, portion of the house is being tenant occupied. But you need to take possession. You need to occupy. Then how many days? Uh, typically 60 to 55 days, depending on the lender. You can ask the lender that. So if there's a lease in place, you can't touch it. It's a 
lender requirement. Yeah. So you have to ask the lender. Uh, typically, I, I mean, ninety-nine percent of the time, would you say lenders will not allow more than sixty days? I have seen some lenders not even allow more than thirty days. So you have to talk to the lender. Yeah, you have to, I have to ask the lender. Yep. Otherwise, they have to go for an owner occupied loan. The rates going to be higher. Typically, the down payment is going to be five to ten percent more, and it will eradicate the loan down payment. So, um, loans like USDA and zero down and FHA. Yeah, so VA, you can't do that. Because VA doesn't have um, investment, right? Investment loans. Other types of loans you can get as an investor, but. If they're selling it, though, there's a tenant in there. So you might be able to talk to them and have them get the tenant out of it. Yep. It's all negotiable. So, so if the seller is, if the buyer needs to take um, occupancy, right? Seller has a tenant in there. And let's say that it's only a month left or whatever. And the seller really wants to sell it to you. They may be willing to talk to the tenant to get them out early prior to close. So there's, there's ways that you could potentially still get the loan. But that's, that's different than what it says here, right? So it says here, how, how is a seller going to deliver? And if... You know, if, if you know that you're going to buy it as an owner occupant because it's dependent on VA, but you know that there's a tenant in there, then you can check possession at uh, free of tenants, but the buy off got to be from the seller because they got to get the tenant out of there in order to deliver it to you with the free, free of tenants. Okay. Um, then I'll go through the uh, termination clauses 01, 02, 03. I'll explain that to them. So termination 01 is due to default. So default for you as a buyer is if you don't put your deposits in on time, uh, those are the big ones, right? Um, so remember I talked about J1 and we have 10 days and you have two business days after completion of J1 if you wanna move forward to get your second deposit into escrow. If you don't do that on time, it says 01 applies, they can cancel on you and keep your original deposit. O2 is within the termination time frame. So I'm saying like, as an example, J1, we have 10 days. If you decide not to buy it because you're not satisfied with the condition based on your inspections, then we need to make sure that we terminate by the 10th day, okay? Because after that, you automatically accept. So I'm trying to explain that to the buyer so they're not going, oh, I got a lot of time and they dilly-dally or they're not accessible and you're guessing you're guessing whether or not they want to cancel. You're guessing that they want to continue. So let them know it's an automatic thing. Either we accept, either we reject prior to the 10 days or they accept automatically. Okay. Um, if there's ever an issue that arises, you agree to first go through mediation, which is 04, you can't resolve it there. Go through arbitration or litigation 05. Okay, and then, um, if I sense or I see that there is a harpta or fructa issue, then I'll explain that to them. R1, I'll explain that to them, right? I'll say that, you know, I'm a realtor. I'm not an attorney. I'm not an engineer, I'm not an accountant. So if you feel you need that kind of help to this process, this section here says, hire for that. Go and get your, go and get your help, okay? Um, and I'll talk about rental property that you know that we, we can't guarantee what it can rent for. We can't guarantee what the future value will be of the property. And I'll say acceptance will be, we'll submit this offer. If seller accepts, um, then it'll start, right? It'll be a, an executed contract. Our dates and times will, will be based on Hawaii standard time. 11 to 59 p.m. ends the day. Um, we can do things electronically. So I can send this to you via DocuSign to sign either the contract or the counter offer, whatever it may be. We can execute based on counterparts. So you can sign one copy, seller can sign another copy and combined it's a fully executed contract. Okay, and that's it. So I'll just kind of go through that with them, explain it if they have any questions and if they're okay with it. Um, I'll have them sign then and there, or I'll send it to them via DocuSign to have them sign it. 
and then I'll package it, right? Package it with my, not pre-qual, my pre-approval letter. Um, I'll ask my lender to make a strength of, of, of uh, strength of buyer call to the agent and say, this buyer is strong. They have the down, they're well qualified, they have good credit. Um, and I'll kind of let them know if we're accepted, but what are we gonna do? First thing is we're gonna coordinate an inspection. Escrow will be in contact with you. They start sending you all this information. Okay. So kind of giving them verbally um, what they should expect if we're lucky enough to get accepted. And after that, I'll let them know, you know, it's kind of like in the beginning, everything's fast and furious. You got all these inspections, you got all these disclosures to review, all this association docs to review, then a little bit of a lull, and then it picks up again with termite inspection or survey or things of that nature, right? And then we close, okay? Any questions from Zoom land or in person? No, thank you. Thanks, Atta. Okay, so if we're if no more questions, I want to thank you for sticking it out over these five grueling sessions because they are grueling. Um, I, but I still think it's a really good way to learn the contract, and I appreciate all the questions and I appreciate the discussion, and I hope that this helps you a little bit in being a, a better agent that are able to handle and, and care for your clients. I want to take this chance to just really thank you for giving up your time and your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. This you're welcome. very valuable and for everybody. Thank you, thank you. So Lisa, what I'd like to do is do the same thing again in start in January or February and just do it on Zoom. Because I think the more that you go through the, and you don't have to come to every session, right? But try to find out where we left off. And maybe there's certain sections that you want to, listen in on because the more that you, you hear it the more that you hear the discussion you hear the scenarios um the better you are at able to being able to uh, represent your client yeah so so thanks again and merry christmas to all of you thank you, thank you. and i'll see you guys merry around christmas.